Hello, dear students. Now uh, we are about to start uh, the lecture number three, L03, uh, with the theme project cost management, risk analysis, and project risk management. And uh, uh, regarding to what we are going to cover in this uh, lecture. Uh, this slide uh, explains uh, the connection of uh, the content of this uh, lecture to uh, the textbook chapters and sections and also the pre-recorded uh, 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 lecture videos. Uh, and uh, one uh, uh, aspect uh, or one content in this lecture is that we are going to go through the application of the three-point method in uh, risk assessment, uh, which uh, you are going to apply in the uh, third uh, group assignment, uh, the assignment of project progress moni monitoring and decision making. And uh, uh, the uh, in particular, uh, the theme of this third assignment, it's, it's a kind of a forthcoming assignment, uh, is uh, earned, value, earned value method, uh, which we are going to talk about later in the next lecture. But uh, this uh, application of the three-point method in risk assess ass assessment is also relevant uh, when you are uh, doing this uh, uh, third group uh, assignment. Okay, now uh, let's uh, take a look uh, what is the content of this uh, lecture. So the items, the content items are listed here. And uh, I don't think uh, that it is worthwhile for me to now uh, to read uh, this I think that you can follow uh, my lecture and uh, at the same time you can uh, understand where we are going in terms of these uh, items. Uh, and uh, also in this picture uh, you have a much more detailed uh, itemization of uh, these uh, rubrics. So uh, you can see that there are these uh, subtopics uh, uh, listed at a rather accurate uh, level in, in, in this uh, slide. Uh, and you can also later on maybe uh, follow and, uh, and, and, and read the contents uh, of what we are about to go through or what we went through. But in the end of this lecture I'm going to kind of also wrap up uh, what we uh, did go through and uh, also what we learned. Uh, there is another slide which I think is rather worthwhile also for us. Okay, uh, what is project cost, cost management? Um, let's uh, define project cost management uh, to start with. Actually, uh, uh, this is more or less uh, connected, this definition, uh, to the purpose of project cost management. So uh, the purpose is uh, to uh, ensure that the project is implemented in a manner that supports the profitability and cost efficiency of the business of the firm or multiple firms that the project is connected to. So projects are not always uh, uh, taking place uh, under, uh, under the hierarchy of one single firm, uh, but uh, projects can also bridge several firms uh, and uh, can in this way uh, be connected to uh, businesses of, uh, of, of several uh, firms as well. Okay, um, this definition, uh, it uh, doesn't mean uh, that cost management is uh, 
uh, only limited uh, to activities of project cost estimating, setting uh, the budget and follow up and control. Actually, uh, the definition which underlines the connection to business and, uh, and the purpose, purposefulness of the project uh, says uh, completely different, uh, gives a completely different message, a kind of broader message. So even though the definition is project cost management, so uh, the cost management is an area, it is a knowledge area in project management, but it is not only connected to costs, but it is connected to rather much uh, uh, to the uh, overall management of the project in a purposeful way. Okay, uh, let's... Uh, uh, discuss this what I just said a little bit uh, by looking at uh, this slide and uh, especially let's look at the uh, three first items one two and three uh, which are uh, colored with uh, uh, blue color so um, first designing the project scope and the end product uh, to making uh, the specifications uh, two, choosing appropriate project execution processes and methods. And uh, th number three, timing and scheduling. So we could argue that or we could uh, start wondering that how these three first things are connected to costs uh, or profits at all. But uh, uh, the, uh, may maybe the basic message here is that costs cannot be managed of their own. Uh, but you must manage other things uh, like designing the end product and managing the actual project work and costs will incur thereof. So if you want to have an impact on cost or uh, revenues or, or, or something, so you must manage either the people or uh, you must uh, design and redesign the specifications of the end product. Uh, you must uh, take off some parts of the end product if you want to reduce costs and, and so on. So uh, it's, it's a kind of a very, uh, let's say, embedded management of the whole project. We just then can see the implications in terms of cost. So costs cannot be managed of their own, but uh, uh, you must uh, really mm, manage uh, other things to uh, be able to have an impact on business opportunities, risks, profitability, revenues and so on uh, in, in a project. Uh, what comes to this number three in this uh, slide, this timing and scheduling, uh, we must also understand that it is not only a question of efficient execution in terms of chronos time, that is a kind of a chronological time. But we also must take into account the right timing or choosing the right moment. For example, if our uh, product development uh, project is to develop a new product for the firm uh, to the market, then we must understand uh, the uh, timing of when to take this new product to the market. For example, to uh, make a better profit or to contribute to sustainability or something else uh, early enough. Or then there are other aspects also in, uh, in terms of timing. Um, uh, we have learned in innovation uh, management uh, that, uh, for example, the first commercial pioneers of bringing some product to the market don't, don't necessarily make the biggest profit even they can do, make uh, bankrupt uh, uh, because it's so difficult to open the market with a new product and then uh, the followers uh, the second and third and so on bringing the same product they, they can then kind of a cash or they can uh, make wealth uh, of, of that uh, product okay um, well, uh, I think that the rest of uh, the items listed here from four, five, six, and so onwards 
I think that they give uh, us an impression that uh, what project cost management also is and it is not really only limited to project cost estimating, setting the budget and follow up and, and control, but uh, this is a much broader uh, view that I encourage us to take in project cost management. Now, a question to students in class and to you, to us. Uh, if you were a project manager in the midst of your project and uh, you have decided to reduce the costs of the project from the freshly updated cost estimate at completion, then what would you do to reduce the project total cost at completion? So you are in the middle of the project and you have a very good estimate of uh, what the costs are to be and you must uh, take some costs off. So what would you do? You can think about this, but I am going to elaborate and give you a kind of a uh, one answer or my opinion about that. I think that I just kind of said it uh, when we were talking about what product cost management is. You must take uh, the technical specifications and you must take a red pen and you must uh, kind of take off some parts of the project end product to reduce cost or you must reduce uh, quality or you must uh, uh, take another contractor that is willing to uh, do the same work for cheaper price. Mm, you maybe uh, must invent new uh, working methods uh, for executing the project which are cheaper or uh, you must uh, hire more uh, effective people to do the work. So actually it is a very active uh, uh, management and, uh, and, and leadership that you must uh, uh, go into when uh, ha uh, to have an impact on the project cost for example. So, as I said, the costs cannot be managed of their own, but you must manage something else uh, to uh, manage the costs and, uh, and, and profit and the kind of a financial outcome of the project. Okay, then uh, now we are going to uh, take up some basic laws of cost behavior in projects. And these are laws or uh, invariances that remain unchanged uh, from project to project. Uh, they apply to any project. And uh, they are connected to the uh, uh, possibility to influence project level costs, uh, which the po possibility is the biggest at the outset of the project. And uh, they are connected to understanding that uh, uh, the cost of a change uh, increases exponentially uh, the, the later you do the actual change. Okay, let's look at these uh, laws and there are three of them. Uh, law number one uh, comes uh, soon, but I uh, first show you this uh, project uh, uh, or system life cycle uh, view, which uh, shows that the project is only part of the system life cycle. Okay, and now uh, law number one. The possibility to influence project level costs decreases steeply in the beginning of the project. And you can see that there is this influence curve, the possibility to influence costs, uh, which kind of a drops uh, very abruptly in the very beginning of the project. And why is that? The natural explanation is that uh, we are making uh, uh, purchase agreements, we are signing contracts, also the investment decision as such is uh, something that we cannot uh, withdraw necessarily or otherwise our stock price is going to uh, drop if we kind of uh, uh, change our uh, announced uh, uh, decisions to public. 
Uh, and uh, the important thing to understand is that uh, uh, the preparing for the project, it, it requires very early activities, like for example, if we are going to uh, build a capital, uh, capital product, for example, uh, uh, some kind of a energy system, for example, we must place an order for the main equipment very early, even maybe in the very beginning of the project, because the manufacturing time, the lead time is so long, so that we can get uh, those main equipment early uh, to the site and, and, uh, and, and the project completed in time. And uh, when we sign the contracts, so we have committed to them, and the cost uh, is going to incur only later. But we have committed, uh, we have committed costs. Uh, we have assigned them, and, and, and uh, that is kind of a costs that already uh, ha is uh, destined to to happen. Uh, and uh, in many projects, we even uh, kind of bind uh, the costs in the very early phase. And uh, uh, after that uh, beginning of the project, it is very difficult to reduce the costs from uh, that level that we are, are already committed to. But what we can do with good management is that we can uh, kind of a uh, uh, kind of uh, manage the project well for not letting the costs uh, to increase radically from that level. So re reduction is rather difficult, but uh, we can still uh, do a lot for good, uh, with good management of uh, preventing the costs from uh, kind of uh, uh, exceeding radically during the project uh, execution. Okay, that was law number one. And law number two, the significance of an average decision decreases uh, steeply in the beginning of the project. Okay, the explanation is almost the same that was in with law number one. Uh, you can see that the significance of an average decision and its risk impacts uh, kind of a um, uh, decrease uh, steeply, and we already talked about what these uh, significant decisions uh, might be. They might be kind of a placing the order, signing contracts, and having a kind of a committed costs, even though the costs will incur much later. And uh, then the number of decisions that, that increases during the project, but uh, the decisions are not that uh, kind of a uh, mission critical or significant as those uh, very early decisions where you really uh, put uh, the project uh, uh, in uh, place by, by, by making these really uh, significant commitments. Okay, law number three. Uh, the cost of a change in the design of the project scope increases exponentially towards the end of the project. And why that would be? Okay. Um, uh, when we are going to make a change, and if we do make the change uh, later, uh, it has happened so that uh, many, uh, um, let's say, uh, other plans or other commitments have been built on that uh, specific um, item or, um, or implemented thing that we are going to change later. And the later we change uh, something uh, that uh, we already have fixed uh, in the very uh, early phases of the project, uh, the more, uh, let's say, indirect changes it leads to. So we must then maybe not only change that one specific uh, plan or that one specific thing, but also 10 other uh, plans or 10 other things that are have been built on, on that specific uh, 
uh, decision or, or plan. And uh, in this respect, we can also uh, take the concept of, uh, um, let's say, freezing, freezing plans uh, uh, up and, uh, uh, well, uh, make a notion that uh, it is very worthwhile to kind of uh, freeze certain plans uh, during the project so that uh, they cannot anymore be changed and we can then build uh, uh, on continual plans based on that specific frozen uh, plan. plan. Uh, for example, in engineering area, we have uh, different categories of, uh, of uh, freezing the documents, for example, engineering documents. Um, we can have, for example, approved for design AFD uh, type of a um, uh, kind of a decision on certain uh, plan, uh, which means that this plan can be used for further specifications and further designing of, of, of further equipment, for example. Or then we can have uh, this kind of a approved for procurement where we can use a plan or a specification for uh, procuring even external uh, equipment. Uh, so it, it is kind of a uh, more, uh, let's say, uh, solid way of freezing something and give permission then even to place orders uh, outside based on that specification that is frozen. Uh, with this uh, uh, AFP approved for procurement uh, 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 type of a, of, of a frozen docu document. Okay, now we went through uh, the basic laws, which is kind of a, a certain kind of a uh, gives us, us an understanding of how to manage the project overall and, and, and what are the kind of a laws in any uh, type of a project. And now we are going to uh, look at the hierarchical structure, uh, structures for cost recording. So we already have been discussed about uh, work breakdown structure, VBS, uh, organization breakdown structure, OBS, and cost breakdown structure, CBS. Well, we have here the work breakdown structure, which is a structure of the project. Uh, it is a uh, itemization of the uh, product into uh, part partial pro uh, products and then uh, the work items that are needed to uh, make uh, the project and uh, its uh, uh, product parts. And now we can see in this picture that there is this OBS, which is a, uh, a structure of the organization that is the firm, firm's organization. And there is a kind of a matrix uh, structure where we can see in the intersections that which departments of the firm's organization are going to put resources in which uh, work breakdown structure elements. So this is a resource-based view. So uh, uh, which uh, departments are going to lend uh, the resources to the project uh, in those intersections where the resources are uh, kind of a need needed. And we are calling uh, these uh, intersections as work packages. But now, now that we have this uh, picture, so I'm going to step to a kind of a, uh, another uh, picture which, uh, through which I want to emphasize the fact that now we are talking about the resourcing, the uh, perspective of resourcing the project and not necessarily the organizational perspective of responsibilities uh, in the project organization. So uh, the resourcing view is different than uh, the responsibility view. And now I'm going to step uh, a little bit uh, aside and uh, 
uh, emphasize this fact. So there, there is a difference between the resources perspective and responsibility perspective. And uh, now we are talking here only about the resourcing perspective. And the uh, uh, responsibility perspective is a completely different thing. And we are not necessarily talking about that at all. If we would like to take uh, the responsibility view, then we would talk about procurement packages by giving the responsibility to certain contractors for a bigger chunks of uh, the project work or responsibility areas in the project organization, for example, responsibility areas of sub-project managers. But that project organization perspective and the responsibilities is different. And now these responsibility areas are depicted in this picture as these kind of green boxes that uh, we must design who takes responsibility of which parts of the project. But we are talking about the resources perspective and let's uh, get back to this resourcing or resources perspective now in the next slide. Okay, now we have this uh, uh, same picture that we had uh, previously, but now we are uh, uh, recognizing that we are talking about cost accounts when we are talking about cost recording uh, instead of work packages. So these intersections of VBS and OBS, they are uh, cost accounts. They can be called cost accounts when we are talking about a cost recording view. Then we have the third dimension, which is a uh, cost breakdown structure, CBS. And also this CBS, like the OBS, it is the structure of the firm, not the structure of the project. And it is connected to uh, the mm, uh, accounts in the management accounting system. Uh, 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 these cost types are connected to uh, the accounts uh, in the firm. So there are some examples what the uh, cost types can be. For example, personal costs, wages and salaries, traveling material and, uh, and services and, in, and income. So uh, this is connected to the kind of a accounting in, in a firm. And that also as a firm structure that helps uh, to itemize uh, the project costs in, with, uh, in any of uh, the firm's projects. But uh, only the WBS work breakdown structure uh, is uh, the genuine uh, project uh, itemization or project breakdown and others are uh, f uh, breakdowns that are connected to the firms. Uh, Okay, um, now we have this title cost cube. We have a three, three dimensional hierarchical uh, kind of a structure or combination of uh, three hierarchical structures. And we can also uh, depict this uh, three dimensions uh, with this kind of a cube where we have uh, WBS, uh, OBS and CBS. And uh, we can also add there a fourth dimension, which is the time. Okay. And now what I want to now uh, talk with you is uh, the uh, uh, itemization and, uh, and uh, uh, level of, uh, let's say, uh, De detailed itemization, itemization of uh, cost elements. And uh, I want now first to uh, make a notion that what costs we are uh, uh, recording to these uh, hierarchical structures. And that is not only actual costs. It can be uh, estimates and it can be budget sums. 
and we can record these costs to these uh, structures already before the project even has started. We can record uh, estimates to these uh, hierarchical structures much before uh, the cost is going to incur. Also committed costs are uh, recorded to these items very early when we sign the contracts and so on. Okay, uh, let's uh, now think about uh, recording cost estimates. And if we have, uh, for example, a very simple uh, work breakdown structure uh, with only 10 uh, items at the lowest level. Then we have uh, a firm's organization which has 10 departments only. So OBS has uh, at the lowest level of the hierarchy only 10 uh, uh, departments. So WBS, OBS, we have uh, 10 times 10, 10, we have potentially um, 100 positions for cost estimates. So we can uh, itemize our cost estimates to uh, 100 different sums if each department is going to participate uh, with their working hours, for example, to each work breakdown structure uh, item. And then when we have, uh, for example, uh, in a simple uh, uh, cost account uh, system, we have, for example, 10 cost uh, types, uh, then we can also uh, subdivide uh, the estimates into 10 different uh, cost types. So 100 uh, times 10, that is 1000 uh, cost estimates. And then if we have a, a project with 10 uh, months and we want to have monthly estimate uh, for these, so it is 10 times 1000, so we have 10,000 potential uh, uh, places for placing the cost estimate sums and also budget sums. So uh, with this example of uh, how, uh, let's say, into detail we can go or with kind of a recording our cost estimates and budgets, uh, I just uh, want to indicate uh, uh, the fact that uh, we should uh, use our, um, let's say, sensible thinking of how detailed uh, estimates we want to uh, make to our cost uh, control system and then uh, start uh, comparing uh, the estimates budget and uh, budgets and probably some other like actual costs. And uh, the message is that uh, we should remain with cost estimates and budgets at the kind of a uh, high enough level uh, not to kind of uh, make uh, the project cost control so uh, elaborate that we are reporting a very detailed level uh, differences there. Otherwise there would be a lot of differences at the detailed level and uh, we cannot anymore, we couldn't anymore concentrate on managing the project, but we are managing actually the cost control system of the project if we go into too much of details. But for those actual costs, we can always record them at the very lowest, uh, very kind of a de most detailed level uh, in these hierarchies, uh, because uh, there is no problem of kind of a recording uh, um, uh, the cost to the uh, most accurate level from the purchase order or from the kind of a uh, time card uh, of work, working hours on a weekly basis. So we can always uh, make the actual cost recordings at the most detailed level. Okay. Um, let's take next uh, uh, what I already said about the estimates and, uh, and, uh, and budgets and committed costs and not only recording actual costs. Let's take a picture where I, with which I underline the kind of a timing principles of, uh, of costs. 
So uh, the timing principles in course recording, uh, we must understand that uh, we use the, these hierarchical uh, structures for recording estimates, recording budgets at certain level of detail, committed costs, which we basically uh, record to our uh, procurement system uh, with certain project uh, numbers in and, and, and we are kind of a following already when signing the contract, uh, the committed costs. Then actual costs are always recorded in firms uh, based on the accrual principle. Uh, so that is based on the kind of a real life delivery, real life uh, delivery kind of a dictates when the cost uh, mm, incurs or when the profit incurs for uh, the one who delivers uh, the service or the equipment. And uh, the money flow can then take place much later. And then we are talking about uh, cash based costs. So there can be some kind of a delay of invoicing and there can also be some uh, uh, time to pay and so on. So uh, the cost incur when the kind of a real, uh, let's say, transaction happens and uh, then uh, the cash based uh, uh, money flow uh, takes place uh, later. Uh, and, and both aspects are important. Also the cash based uh, uh, costs are important when uh, making the contracts, for example, uh, with a contractor. So it is important that the contractor doesn't finance the customer and the customer doesn't finance the uh, contractor, but uh, the cash flows are in balance in terms of uh, how the uh, actual work uh, progresses so that there wouldn't be too much of kind of a financing uh, to uh, either direction from the customer to the supplier or the supplier to the customer. And then uh, in this picture there is this number five recording information from the received invoice uh, that is somewhere in between when you get an invoice and you record it. So uh, mm, I don't even know how to call it, but uh, it is not kind of a accrual principle based on cost, uh, kind of a, when the cost real uh, really incurs or it is not the cash based, but it is something in between just recording uh, from the kind of a invoice. Okay, um, but I think that these things are uh, rather uh, familiar to you also from the industrial um, introduction to industrial engineering and management course. So, uh, so uh, I, I think that this is kind of a rather basic stuff still, but it applies to projects as well because projects take place in companies and uh, the company systems, uh, uh, information systems are used uh, uh, in an integrated manner to project management and project follow-up. Okay, now uh, there is a question, a multiple choice question to you. And uh, the question is, in your opinion, which uh, ones of the following statements uh, are true? And if you want, you can put uh, the video in a kind of a pause mode and think about your answers. I'm going to tell my elaboration about the answers now. Um, first, the more detailed the cost element decomposition, uh, 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 it, it's uh, allowing to estimate costs for detailed itemized elements, the more accurate the resulting aggregate project uh, cost estimate is. So, um, I just uh, kind of uh, maybe indirectly said that uh, this is not true, this is false, uh, or this is not necessarily true. Because uh, when uh, we go into very uh, detailed decomposition, we cannot necessarily anymore see uh, the woods from uh, the trees. And uh, we need also uh, top-down, high-level, uh, 
estimates where we compare the project's total cost with other similar projects. And we might need also the bottom-up uh, detailed uh, cost calculations uh, to understand uh, another view of the uh, cost estimate. So the cost estimate accuracy, accuracy doesn't uh, necessarily come from a detailed uh, cost element decomposition. It can even be the vice versa. Okay, uh, then the second one. The cost estimates are updated continuously throughout the project life cycle. Yes, uh, and when we later are talking also about uh, the uh, deviation reporting and how we should look uh, to the future at the completion of the project, we must really uh, uh, understand uh, 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 continuously uh, about what the latest uh, estimate uh, at the co project completion is. So yes, this is true. Then number three, project cost management doesn't include estimating revenues. Okay, we defined uh, project cost management rather broadly and uh, definitely uh, this is false. So it includes revenues, it includes the benefits, it includes uh, many uh, other things that are connected uh, to the actual business of the firm or the, uh, of the fir several firms. Number four, estimate uh, is a kind of a forecast. So cost estimate is a representation of cost that is of the nature of a forecast. Yes, this is true. And then number five, budget is the same as kind of a cost objective or cost objective is actually called budget. Yes, this is true. Okay, now let's talk about uh, cost estimate and cost estimating. Mm. And I'm going to elaborate this uh, subject by uh, talking now about uh, risk assessment and the application of, of the three-point method in risk assessment, where we actually assess the risks in terms of their cost implications. Okay, uh, I think that this is rather natural uh, to talk about this three-point method and uh, we kind of uh, uh, kill uh, two birds with one stone. We are talking about cost estimating and we are talking about risk estimating uh, at the same time in a way. Uh, this picture is familiar to you uh, from previous uh, lectures and uh, I don't think that I need to explain that uh, or repeat the explanation that I did uh, in those uh, previous lect uh, lectures about this uh, picture. So uh, we are uh, talking about cost estimates or risk estimates if you like, where we are uh, estimating uh, the cost in terms of minimum, most probable and maximum uh, estimate values. And we can uh, 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 assume that these three values are uh, parameters of a skewed probability distribution, like for example beta distribution, which is not a continuous distribution. Uh, and uh, when we use the approximation provided to us by the BERT method, PERT, Program Evaluation and Review Technique, where uh, that technique allows uh, stochastic interpretation of, uh, of, of, of a certain, uh, uh, let's say, variables. Then we can uh, calculate the approximation of the expected value or mean uh, and standard deviation with the equations that are shown in the right corner of this picture. So expected value is minimum plus four times uh, most probable value plus maximum uh, divided by six. Standard deviation is maximum minus minimum uh, divided by six. And we have been uh, calculating uh, this uh, mean and standard deviation values in this picture 
when we have this estimate of minimum 150, most probable 250 and maximum 600. And how do we use these estimates then uh, in the overall cost estimating of, or total cost estimating of the uh, project or uh, estimating the risks of a project. So here is an example. So uh, we have a basic estimate. The basic estimate can be this 150, 250 and 600 as you can see in this uh, table. And uh, uh, it also could be that the basic estimate could be only uh, kind of a, uh, including not necessarily variation at all, but it can be that the minimum, most probable and maximum would all be, for example, 250. But then we have identified certain risks, uh, which are weather conditions, uh, attitude of customer and uh, staff motivation. So it's rather interesting also here that uh, we have identified risks which are immaterial and they are not necessarily connected to the uh, detailed decomposition of the cost elements of our cost estimate, but we kind of look the project uh, uh, very broadly and we think uh, diff uh, kind of risks that uh, may affect the whole project and they cannot necessarily be itemized according to the uh, basic cost estimate itemization necessarily. And we can see that uh, for example in the estimate of weather conditions uh, the uh, estimate of weather conditions uh, the minimum is minus 50 which means that in a very favorable weather conditions we even can reduce or the cost can be reduced by uh, uh, in the most favorable uh, uh, situation uh, with 50 euros. And then of course the maximum, uh, there is a skewed distribution but the maximum is, is, is further away uh, to the unfavorable side which is 150. And also attitude of the customer and staff motivation, there can be also favorable outcomes. Uh, you can see the minus uh, uh, um, numbers uh, in, in the minimum estimates of those. Okay, now we use uh, these equations and uh, calculate the uh, expected value for each of the, uh, let's say, uh, risk or, or each uh, uh, partial distribution uh, and uh, also the standard deviation for each uh, distribution and then we calculate uh, the total cost effect or total risk effect by uh, summing up the uh, expected values and we get uh, uh, the expected value of the whole project with these risk effects which is 379. And then uh, we uh, 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 take the power of 2 of the standard deviation where we uh, and we actually uh, have the variations of each uh, distribution and we uh, sum up the variations and then uh, take the square root of uh, the sum and then we can have uh, the uh, standard deviation of the total cost effect or total uh, risk uh, estimate of, of the project. Okay. How do we then treat uh, this uh, total mean and total uh, standard deviation? Or what are our assumptions, uh, uh, further assumptions? Uh, when we have this sum of these partial distributions, so uh, we can assume that even though the partial distributions are skewed distributions, so the sum uh, uh, with only few skewed distributions is normally distributed. And we assume uh, that uh, the sum distribution is in, uh, has the form of a normal distribution. So we have uh, the mean value 
and then we have the standard deviation. And if we take uh, uh, the standard deviation, uh, well, mean value plus uh, one standard deviation, then we have a kind of a 86% uh, uh, fractile uh, of the cumulative distribution. And if we uh, go two standard deviations uh, away from uh, the uh, mean value, then we have 98% fractile uh, of the cumulative distribution. Well, now we have here the kind of a bell-shaped curve and uh, of the normal distribution, and we can also uh, make the representation of that uh, distribution as a kind of a cumulative distribution. And we can see that the mean is 379. Uh, we can also see different fractals, like 70% fractal is 431, and 90% uh, fractal is uh, 507. So this is the estimate. The total cost estimate or total risk estimate, if you like. And now it's the kind of a time to make decisions based on this estimate and uh, put some targets, for example. So this is an, the estimate. Now it's time to make decisions. So based on the estimate, we must make a decision about the budget. Which sum would we set as the objective or as the budget of the project? And what about project manager's budget contingency? Should we put how big sum of contingency for the project manager's budget. Decision making is different, uh, difficult. It, it, it is not uh, just choosing between two values, a, a kind of a smaller figure and a bigger figure. And uh, if it's a uh, cost, then we would uh, choose the smaller figure. And if it would be a revenue, then, then we would choose the bigger figure. But we have now a probability distribution representation where we have several possible uh, figures, se several possible numbers, and we must uh, make a decision uh, of what we set as the kind of a cost target for the project. And it is more or less, it is about the kind of a negotiation between the project manager and the sponsor of the project who sets uh, up the project and initiates the project. And uh, they can agree that uh, they set the target to, for example, the average value, that is the mean value, 379. But they can also agree that uh, if the project manager thinks that uh, uh, they would like to uh, manage the project with a kind of a more tight targets, uh, and it is rewarding for uh, them to um, try to uh, kind of a, a make uh, more efficiency out of the project. It even can be that they could choose uh, to set the target to something like 40% uh, fract uh, fractile. Or then uh, they set the target uh, to a kind of a, to be on the safe side to the 70% fractile. Or uh, that the project manager's budget is 379 plus contingency 52 euros when uh, the uh, budget with project manager's budget contingency is 431. Then there is also a question that if we uh, would sell this project to the customer, then what is the sales price? What is the selling price to the customer? How, what do we offer as the selling price? Um, maybe some figure where we would be on the safe side, like this 90% fractal, 507, or even much bigger uh, uh, figure, let's say selling price uh, 600 or 700. That also depends on the market and in, on the competitive situation. Uh, but it also can be that if we uh, put too high price for the customer, the customer cho uh, chooses another supplier and uh, there is a risk that we are uh, 
losing this business deal. And if we want it really bad, then uh, it might be that we could even sell it uh, rather cheaply, even without uh, a substantial profit at all. And we might think that it is important to have this customer and to make kind of a reference value and then get other customers based on this uh, uh, wonderful de delivery that we can uh, make for the customer. Okay, uh, but uh, these are the considerations uh, and, and this uh, quantitative way of uh, expressing uh, the variation and the risks uh, helps us to make these decisions. Even though the decision making is not difficult because we have many values and also uh, mm, there are many, many options to and many strategies to uh, go with the kind of price or the budget target. Okay, now a question to you. Uh, when applying the three point method in risk assessment or cost assessment, it is advantageous to, and then we have these four uh, claims here, one, two, three, and four. And uh, now, uh, if you want to think about your answer, so you can put the video on pause, and uh, I'm going to tell my uh, answers to these four. Uh, state, statements that, that what, what is advantageous. Okay, um, uh, first, it is advantageous to take the previously prepared detailed cost estimate itemization as a starting point and provide minimum, most probable and maximum estimates for these detailed level cost ele elements. So instead of the previously expressed single point estimates. Okay. Uh, this is false. What I said is that really if we are really thinking about the cost uh, and, and risk, we must take a broad view to the whole project and think also very much in material things. And if there is a kind of a cost estimate accuracy, we cannot start uh, estimating the kind of a uh, bits and pieces, very uh, detailed decomposition risks, but we must somehow uh, estimate uh, the, for example, the uh, estimate accuracy at the higher level and think about the risks that are connected to the whole project. You can remember from my example that there was those, this uh, weather conditions and uh, customer's attitude and, uh, and, and people's motivation, workers' motivation in a project, which is uh, the kind of a perspective to look at the risks and uh, give some estimates to risks. And if we go to very detailed decomposition and start estimating risks there, we cannot anymore see the uh, woods from, uh, from the uh, trees. Uh, I mean that uh, we are not realistic uh, at the level of the whole project, but we just are kind of a, uh, calculating some kind of a unit costs and or variation in unit costs. Okay, number two, it is advantageous to try to stretch the distance uh, in the cost axis between the minimum and maximum estimates by expressing a small minimum estimate as possible and uh, expressing as great value as possible for the maximum respectively. And the purpose for this arrangement would be to have a big enough deviation in terms of probabilistic interpretation and to avoid anchoring heuristics. So my uh, argument is that this is true. And uh, this is connected uh, to the fact and, and th to the thinking that uh, people are not very good uh, estimators. And uh, there is always a tendency to uh, uh, estimate two narrow distributions and uh, to have an anchoring, uh, have an anchor, which is the uh, 
first initial value and then think that okay the risks can be plus minus one or two percent uh, around this, this anchor. And uh, it is very advantageous for the uh, facilitator to try to broaden the perspective of the estimators and try to have them to think about the uh, most unfavorable, uh, uh, let's say, maximum value and most uh, uh, favorable minimum value of cost and, and, and what uh, the potential uh, risk events might be that lead to them. And of course, because the estimators are uh, uh, professional experts in their areas, even though we try to stretch the minimum and maximum, I think that uh, they don't expect, uh, express uh, any values that they cannot necessarily defend or reason uh, or provide some scenarios of, uh, of how these values might uh, take place. So that is not a kind of a skewing the estimate, but that is kind of a making it more realistic to increase the variation and think a little bit out of the box of the own responsibility area and uh, look outside and, and, and what uh, the actual biggest implications might be and in this way increase the vari uh, variation. Okay, number three, uh, when estimating the three values, quantitatively, then it is advantageous to concentrate on eliciting these three values only and to aim at accuracy of those estimates. And therefore it is advantageous to avoid verbal or written qualitative uh, 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 reasoning explaining the possible mechanisms or scenarios that would result to those quantitative three estimates. Okay, uh, now, uh, this is uh, false. It is very advantageous not to avoid the verbal expression and, 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 and scenario, uh, uh, expressing scenarios, but vice versa, it is really beneficial when you are uh, expressing the quantitative uh, minimum, most probable, maximum value so that you provide the reasoning and you provide the qualitative uh, verbal uh, or wording based uh, explanations for those values. That gives an understanding to the whole team uh, estimating the risks, that uh, what the risks are and that also enables uh, finding uh, certain responses uh, management actions and, and, and many other good things in that same session about what is the nature of the risks and what we should do for the risks. So actually the quantitative estimates are uh, not uh, uh, presented as kind of a isolated uh, numerical uh, figures, but uh, when they are estimated they also kind of encourage uh, thinking deeply and talking deeply about what the risks actually are and what we must make, uh, uh, well, do with them. Then number four actually is also connected to this. Uh, it is uh, beneficial to also to express responses at the same time when you estimate uh, the risks and you provide this qualitative uh, verbal or uh, uh, written uh, explanations about what the risks are. So the four says, number four uh, statement says, when estimating the three values quantitatively, then it is advantageous not to confuse this assessment uh, phase with the later upcoming plan risk uh, responses phase by expressing possible responses or management actions yet. Well, my uh, well claim is that it is really uh, advantageous to uh, express those responses at the same time. When you are thinking about the risk, you are talking about what the risks are, you can also uh, ideate uh, with your team what responses should be made. And you can also agree uh, about responsibilities. And when you kind of then dissolve the team and you walk out of the room, then uh, everybody uh, knows what they do. and. Uh, you have a kind of a, a good comprehension of uh, what you should do for those risks. 
also and you have agreed about uh, that. Okay. Then we are going to talk about setting the budget and using the cost estimate information when setting the budget, setting the targets. Okay, in the left side of this picture, uh, there is the cost estimate. So, uh, there are our cost estimates uh, of the uh, tasks or sub-projects and then there is the cost estimate contingency uh, marked with blue color. And cost, estimate, cost estimate contingency is uh, kind of a, a sum which uh, is uh, estimated for uh, unfavorable risk impacts or uh, uh, the estimate uh, uncertainty, the effects of estimate uncertainty. And then we have in the left side of the picture, we have uh, calculated the uh, cost estimate uh, tasks or parts of the cost estimate together uh, to a total cost estimate. And then we have total cost estimate contingency. We have uh, calculated those contingencies together. We also have uh, this uh, probability distribution representation in the left side. Uh, there is an alternative not to express the cost estimate contingency as a kind of a deterministic sums, but we can also estimate this by having this uh, cost, uh, well, probability distribution representation of, for example, minimum, most probable, and maximum, and so on. Now, uh, to the right side of the picture, uh, there is uh, the kind of a budget, total budget, and budget contingency of the project manager. And uh, the budget and budget contingency, it is a kind of a negotiation process and decision making process where the project manager and the sponsor uh, initiating the project can agree uh, about the budget and the budget contingency. Of course, they use the cost estimate as one uh, source of information when, when doing that uh, decision or, or making that decision. But it can be that uh, the total budget of the project is not uh, exactly the same as the cost estimate. It can be tighter, it can be something different. And also the logic here uh, by when setting the budget contingency for the project manager, that it is different than the sum of the cost, uh, total cost estimate contingency, is that all, not all risks happen at the same, not all unfavorable impacts of risks happen at the same time and then you can then uh, provide uh, the project manager with a budget contingency which is different than the cost estimate uh, contingency. And by the way, cost estimate contingency and budget contingency, uh, contingency are totally different kinds of uh, sums or different kinds of vehicles like I'm going to explain you in the next uh, slide. Then the company management can have a, a contingency of the budget so uh, the company management can use more conservative uh, values for for example profitability calculations uh, or investment uh, decisions and uh, then there might be also the revenue budget uh, uh, from project delivery, if this is a delivery project to the customer. Okay. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to talk about the different nature of cost estimate contingency and budget contingency. So, listen carefully. Uh, cost estimate contingency is an estimate based sum which covers anticipated favorable effects of risks and effects of estimate uncertainty. We can also use the probability distribution type of a uh, de uh, description of uh, the cost estimate where we have several values that might take place and uh, different uh, probabilities connected to these values. Project manager's budget contingency 
is the project manager's cost allowance tool. And uh, the project management can uh, use that for uh, their active management of uh, the project work. So the project manager has the budget contingency uh, in their budget at the project level. And uh, they can use uh, the budget contingency in various ways. So like there in this picture, there is this A uh, transfer move part of the project manager's contingency sum, uh, contingency sum down to sub projects to increase the uh, budget of uh, the subordinate responsibility areas, that is uh, sub-project manager's responsibility areas. So the project manager can move parts of uh, the budget contingency to the budget of the subordinates. Or B, keep the contingency sum at the project level, and if there are uh, cost uh, or overruns uh, at the lower levels, then at the pr whole project level, uh, it uh, kind of a, is uh, kind of a covered by this project uh, manager's uh, budget contingency, and uh, and there is no uh, overrun at the project level anymore when, you, when we sum up uh, uh, the actual costs and and, and budgets uh, to the. Uh, project level, to the aggregate, aggregate level. Okay, uh, now again a question or uh, question or statements to you. In your opinion, which ones of the following statements are true? Well, uh, if you want, you can again now put the video at pause and think about your answers, because I'm going now to elaborate and tell uh, what my answers to these uh, statements would be. Okay, first, cost estimate contingency is an estimate-like or forecast-like sum, which covers anticipated unfavorable effects of risks and effects of estimate uncertainty. True. No, maybe much need to discuss about that. Two, the size of the project manager's budget contingency can be freely agreed between the project sponsor and project manager by considering circumstantial factors and issues like, uh, for example, the cost estimate contingency. True, decisions must be made by using all information. One is the cost estimate, contingency and cost estimate in general, but there might be several other uh, re, uh, uh, issues that must be taken into account when setting the objective, setting the budget. Okay, number three. It is a good practice for the project manager to transfer the project manager's contingency sub-projects to increase each sub-project's budget with a sum that is proportional to risks and estimate uncertainty in each sub-project. False. This is false. Uh, it is not a good practice to give for the project manager its, uh, their contingency to the sub-projects and increase the uh, sub-projects' budgets. Uh, because we don't know yet where the risks are going to take place. Where, in which sub-project there would be surprises, cost overruns and, 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 and risks. Uh, and uh, if the project manager would distribute the budget down to each sub-project, it also can be that the sub-projects would use those budgets and there might not be reason to use those budgets for each or uh, many sub-projects, but only for those uh, uh, where uh, severe risks, for example, take place. Uh, number four, 
if a sub-project manager, manager's budget is exceeded due to an unforeseen risk event, then it is a good practice for the project manager to transfer such part of the project manager's contingency uh, to the respective sub-project's budget, which would cover the unfavorable effects of the risk event. In this way, reporting of budget overruns for this sub-project can be avoided. Okay. So if risks happen uh, in a sub-project, uh, then the project manager can transfer uh, part of their uh, budget contingency to the sub-project and avoid uh, reporting uh, uh, overruns uh, in this way because uh, the budget of the sub-project was increased. Well, is this a, a good practice? Uh, it depends. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, the, this can be also false, it can be true, but uh, uh, let's say that the project manager doesn't need necessarily to transfer uh, the parts of the, uh, the budgets to sub-projects. Because uh, it is not necessarily always uh, to kind of a, uh, try to uh, uh, kind of a hide, uh, let's say, deviations by adjusting, uh, for example, budget sums. It uh, can as well be a good practice to let the sub-project uh, to report the uh, overrun, and then there would always be an explanation for the overrun. And the explanation can be that there was a kind of a surprise that was something that was not a kind of a uh, fault of the sub-project manager. Uh, and then at the project level, uh, uh, the uh, project manager's uh, contingency covers uh, the uh, overrun of uh, that uh, sub-project as well. So, um, the project manager can transfer uh, the part of the budget uh, to the sub-project, but uh, it can as well be a, a good practice of not to transfer it, but uh, to have just a kind of an explanation and uh, an understanding of uh, where the deviations uh, come from. Okay. Then uh, rolling wave. Now uh, let's talk about uh, the rolling wave principle uh, in uh, budgets, uh, uh, kind of a budget items and, and, and setting uh, uh, targets to uh, detailed uh, budget items and also in making uh, estimates uh, more detailed or the decomposition of uh, estimates more detailed as the project uh, uh, unfolds. Okay, I explain this rolling wave uh, by this picture. Uh, we have time now, and then we have uh, time x months uh, uh, ahead. And let's assume that we have, uh, uh, let's say, stable uh, uh, use of uh, resources or capacity in a project. And these tiles or tasks or cost elements uh, describe uh, uh, this uh, stable volume, uh, these tiles that are piled uh, together uh, for that uh, stable uh, resource usage. Now, uh, there, at this point of time, time now, there are activities for which budgets are in use. So actual costs are being registered or recorded uh, to these uh, 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 activities. Uh, in the history, we have activities uh, which are closed. The budget is closed uh, and uh, we cannot anymore record to those items. In the near future, we have activities uh, that have been defined uh, at the kind of a, a rather detailed uh, budget itemization. And then when we look further, we have activities that are uh, described only at the rough level 
and uh, the budget sums are to be uh, detailed or further decomposed when we come closer uh, to the actual point of time when these activities are uh, uh, executed. This principle also applies to cost uh, estimates uh, when uh, there are items that are further into the future we don't need to have a kind of a, as detailed decomposition. It can even be that the estimate accuracy is better uh, if we have a kind of a more rough decomposition of the cost elements in the further in the, in the future. But when they come closer, we can then uh, make, uh, let's say, more detailed decomposition of those items in terms of estimates also. Okay, uh, then uh, one thing that I want to discuss uh, with you is uh, the direct and indirect costs. We must be aware what kind of a costs we are recording uh, to our, uh, uh, let's say, project uh, numbers or project work breakdown structure elements. Whether they are direct costs or whether they are indirect costs, whether they are apples or oranges. Uh, direct costs uh, mean the following. If we pay 20 euros uh, an hour to a person, then we must also pay uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, salary for uh, the holiday season, uh, uh, kind of a, uh, uh, let's say, obligatory uh, uh, work insurance costs and so on uh, defined in the law. And that means that if we pay uh, 20 euros to a person per hour, then uh, the other direct costs for these reasons are some 10 euros. So we have a direct cost of some 30 euros per hour. Uh, then uh, when it comes to indirect costs is that uh, in a company there are all kinds of administration uh, costs. Uh, there are the managing director, there might be marketing people, there might be some uh, administrative people. Then we have uh, the uh, office facility, the rent of the office. We have all kinds of uh, uh, costs uh, that uh, we must uh, uh, pay for uh, having uh, the company running. And uh, Many times uh, these uh, overhead costs or these in indirect costs are kind of a, uh, um, let's say, uh, transferred uh, to the productive uh, hours, work hours. And it means that uh, in general that uh, if a person is paid 20 euros per hour and that is a kind of a productive uh, work hour, then uh, to put the overheads uh, on the top of that, we must use the co uh, the uh, let's say uh, um, uh, factor of some five or six to mu multiply uh, this cost uh, to have uh, the overhead costs uh, added to that. So kind of indirect cost added to that productive hour. So twenty euros per hour. Uh, direct uh, salary uh, means that it is about 100 uh, uh, euros per hour or 120 euros per hour with indirect costs. Okay, so apples or oranges, you must know what uh, the actual cost is that we are follow following for a project and that also is important in terms of uh, whether that is a kind of a, a income statement uh, cost or direct cost uh, to, to certain place in the in income statement or, or whether uh, that is uh, some other costs uh, that are a kind of a general, uh, let's say, uh, uh, fixed costs for the company, which are more or less the fixed costs are this indirect or or, or overhead type of a costs in the balance, uh, well, uh, sorry, in the uh, income statement. Uh, 
then uh, let's look uh, at uh, sample project reports, sample project cost reports. And let's start by uh, uh, reminding us about the deviation reporting that we did have uh, at the very first lecture. So I want to remind uh, with this slide that uh, our eyes should be kept fixed on the project completion uh, and uh, not uh, on the rear view mirror. If we have a project uh, with uh, 20 months duration and uh, the time now is uh, seven months, so we are now at the point of time of seven months from the inception. And we do uh, uh, deviation reporting. Uh, the cost report at seven months time uh, shows that the budget at this seven months uh, time is 300 and the actual cost is 250. And now I animate this budget 300 in this cumulative picture as well. So here it is 300. Then at this same time, at the seven months time, we also report the status at the project completion. The budget at project completion is 1000 and cost estimate is 1500. It doesn't anymore look very good in a way. And I animate this 1000 to this cumulative picture. Here it is. And this allows us to make correction, uh, corrective actions early. So we can do the uh, corrective actions uh, well in advance during the execution when we are kind of looking towards the future and we can uh, understand that we must, for example, reduce cost if we need to reduce the cost uh, from this uh, cost estimate of 1,500. And we already discussed uh, about that when I had a question to you in the very uh, early uh, of this same lecture. Uh, that what, how do you reduce the costs? And uh, naturally you take, for example, the specifications and drawings and you kind of take the red pen and you tick something out uh, of this project scope and then we might reach the budget of 1000. Or then we might need to go to the customer or to the sponsor and uh, ask for more budget to uh, make this project uh, uh, with 1,500 and so on. Now this project cost status report uh, shows the same, uh, uh, let's say, as this deviation reporting uh, thing uh, we just saw. Uh, in this report we have the left side inception to time now. So we have the budget, estimate, committed actual and so on. And then we have this right side of this uh, report, which is the project total, where we look at the completion of the project. We have their estimate and budget and we have then the differences, uh, what it looks like at the completion of the project. Then at this left side, we have these committed costs, which are uh, the costs that have already occurred, uh, they, they have incurred and uh, uh, they are also costs that we have uh, committed to uh, through uh, purchase orders or contracts. We have signed the contracts and we can see uh, that we already have committed 85,000 uh, out of uh, the total cost budget of something like 100,000. So at this point of time in the project when we do the reporting we already have almost committed all the cost in the project. And of course there are revenues uh, uh, with 110,000 which means that we make a profit of uh, 10,000 and so on. We have this same report in the graph format but uh, then there is not the itemization of uh, work breakdown structure elements. Uh, and uh, this uh, graph uh, style report uh, provides us the following information. We have the cumulative, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, cost and income uh, budget there, 
till the end of the project, 36 months, and we can see that there is this 10,000, roughly 10,000 profit uh, in the end of the pro uh, project uh, based on our income budget and cost budget. Then we have uh, the follow-up of uh, actual costs and actual income, which uh, rather well follows uh, the budget uh, sums uh, to this point of time, which is 12 months from the beginning. And then we have this steep curve, uh, which is committed costs uh, uh, until this 12 months time. So we have already committed quite a lot of these projects, total costs, but the cost will incur uh, only later. What we cannot see here in this picture, for example, there could have been uh, these uh, cumulative estimate curves of uh, the income and cost until the end of the pro uh, project, until the 36 months time. Uh, but uh, for having not this picture becoming uh, too messy, so we have not included all uh, possible curves. Uh, in, in this uh, reporting. Then uh, that report that we saw uh, was based on accrual based costs, uh, kind of a realization principle. When the real transactions uh, take place, then the cost incurs. But then uh, it is also important to uh, uh, report the cash flows. Uh, the uh, Cash flows are uh, probably delayed a uh, few months uh, from the actual uh, 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 incurred accrual based costs. Uh, and we talked already uh, about the cash flows and the importance of also balancing the cash flows from uh, the financing perspective. And uh, now uh, we are going to uh, move to project risk management uh, discussion. And I have tried in this very end of this lecture to uh, include the uh, most important, the basic uh, uh, aspects of project risk management in almost one slide or two slides. So listen carefully. Uh, and uh, I hope that this gives you a perspective of uh, understanding and thinking about what project uh, uh, risk management can be and when you are studying uh, the textbook and, uh, and, and, and the uh, pre-recorded uh, lecture videos. So I hope that you can then better digest uh, the nuances of project risk management when having this information that we are now going to share. First, the title. Project risk management is a continuous activity during the project life cycle. And the project life cycle is now uh, depicted with these phases that you can see in this picture. And uh, project risk management process is rather simple, basically. Uh, identify, analyze, and plan responses. And then you must also uh, assign the responsibilities for the responses so that someone does the responses. So the responses take place later maybe. They are agreed when the risks are identified and the responses are planned. But it can be that the responses uh, like for example following certain contractors uh, manufacturing process might take uh, place much later in the project. Then we repeat the identify, analyze and plan responses uh, uh, phase again. And we find out uh, that there are needs for uh, additional responses. Then we repeat, analyze, identify, analyze and, and plan responses and repeat and, uh, in uh, very many places in the project life cycle when it is appropriate. But when we do this rather often, we also can make sure that uh, those people doing the projects are well aware continuously about the risks 
also when they are uh, doing their own, own responsibility areas in the projects and managing the projects, also in between of these sessions where we uh, gather uh, together and, uh, and, and do this kind of a risk analysis um, uh, process phases uh, every now and then. Uh, it is important uh, that we do the risk management in group meetings and we agree in the meetings also about the responsibilities of doing something for the risks. Identifying risk is probably the most challenging stage. And why is that? People tend to identify issues that are connected to their area of specialization. But when those people are specialized in these areas and doing also the project work in those areas, it can be that they take care of those risks anyways in those areas. And somehow the risks should be thought more broadly and think outside, outside of the box and uh, try to identify uh, risks from the areas that we don't know. And that is a paradoxical issue to identify something in some areas that we don't know about the area. So how can we identify risks uh, in areas that we are not familiar with? Okay. That is why we need facilitators to help uh, the group processes to think more broadly. And uh, uh, we might uh, need also some kind of a group working methods uh, and uh, we must be courage enough to express even rather wild uh, estimates about what might go wrong and in that way to have an ideation uh, that uh, goes beyond and outside what we are typically thinking about where we concentrate on, on, on our uh, actual project work. Favorable and unfavorable events, it's important to understand also the favorable side of risks and uh, take actions to take advantage of the favorable uh, uh, opportunities. Uh, verbal and written qualitative estimates and discussions in group meetings is important. It can be that in the group meetings we uh, elicit quantitative values, quantitative numbers, but when we do it, we are discussing uh, normally very, uh, let's say, in a very rich manner with verbal or written qualitative arguments. And that gives us an understanding of what the risks actually are that are connected to these est uh, quantitative estimates. Uh, then we must have uh, subjectivistic estimates because we don't have frequencies of civil similar projects uh, that uh, might give us a kind of a uh, objective uh, probabilities or frequencies, but we must uh, rely on uh, specialized experts that are uh, giving uh, uh, the estimates. Uh, the concept of uncertainty is uh, relevant. Uh, uncertainty means uh, knowing or not knowing what we don't know. It, it is connected to knowledge and uh, do human beings who are estimating, do they know how much they know and do they know what they don't know and can they include them uh, that uh, lack of knowledge, for example, as an estimate error in their own estimates. Mm -hmm. We must uh, be aware of these uh, potential problems. Uh, human beings are not uh, very good uh, estimators. Uh, the subjectivistic estimate, uh, estimates uh, lead many times to biases uh, and, and possible roles of, of facilitators is a kind of a needed to think a little bit uh, uh, broader. And then assumptions are really uh, important. Normally we make assumptions, we either express them or we don't even express them because it is some so self-evident that, for example, we don't take into account uh, the economic situation or recession or some political situations in a target country or something. 
but it is even for that reason it's it's, it's important to write down the assumptions and uh, I would even suggest that we consider that the success uh, assumptions might be the biggest uh, risks actually uh, and we can include the assumptions to our risk list and start e estimating uh, what the pos potential deviations in these assumptions or if these assumptions are not true might affect uh, if we consider them uh, as risks. Uh, then uh, about this subjectivistic estimates and biases. So in this slide uh, we have listed uh, the typical biases and heuristics in uh, let's say estimations or estimates of hum human beings. So uh, overconfidence, optimism, groupthink and ho heuristics I was already talking about anchoring then there might be this representativeness that uh, uh, a human estimator takes uh, uh, another project as a representative uh, project for making estimates for this project even though it is actually completely different and not representative at all. Then there is availability that what, the peop what people can memorize and uh, which previous cases they can uh, get into their memory and minds when uh, to, uh, providing their estimates. So these uh, are uh, potential heuristics that lead to certain biases uh, that human estimators are not that, uh, let's say, accurate or, uh, or, or uh, analytical uh, in producing uh, estimates. And the facilitator's role, uh, again, uh, to mention it might be important to have people to uh, think in a group uh, more freely and not uh, based on this, what is listed in the last uh, item of the biases thing, like group think, where there is a false consensus that the group could uh, fall into. Okay, now this is the final slide. What did we learn in this lecture? There is a lot of items now listed in this slide. Uh, I also have uh, tried to kind of uh, emphasize certain things with these colors, uh, blue colors and, uh, and red colors. So I don't necessarily want to uh, walk through in detail this uh, slide, but uh, this is for you if you like later to look at what we learned, which things we went through and which, uh, let's say, items or arguments or statements that I have listed here in this summary slide are something that are worthwhile for our learning experience. So, thank you very much for uh, being with me in this lecture. It uh, was uh, really uh, enjoyable to talk about uh, project cost management, uh, risk analysis and uh, project risk management. And uh, well, I'm looking very much forward to uh, seeing you in the uh, next lectures or spending time with you in the next lectures as well. So. Thank you very much. Bye.